as for our When Women Heal, When Women Heal Monday night meet up with Dr. K. She has a new name she's going to introduce to you all tonight. You may be able to take a guess from looking at her beautiful image on the screen. And tonight we're actually going to take a deep dive into the emotion of sadness. Dr. K has done a phenomenal job with helping us explore, honor, and express ourselves with anger and also happiness. Um, and so for this week and next week, we're going to take a deep dive and explore the emotion of are we going to talk about levels of sadness, understanding the emotion of sadness, but also healthy ways to express our sadness. So Dr. K, we just want to thank you so much for your level of commitment. I know that with some of the past weeks we've gone over, so feel free to cut the training down. Dr. K, if we need to finish right at nine o'clock, uh, we will follow your lead, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. K, and ask that you also share with the group the exciting news that you have. Good evening, good evening, good evening. I am excited again to be here, as always, and Tierra, thank you so much for the opportunity. Tanisha, Thank you for your faithful service. Good evening, everybody. I have the wonderful privilege and honor of introducing uh, my new identity. I am now the Tilted Fedora Trainer. A lot of you who've uh, heard me speak or seen me speak know that I try to show up on formal occasions always in a Tilted Fedora. And now that has become my moniker, along with Dr. K, which is a name that I've been lovingly given by this group, and I am grateful for it. I'm going to open us up in prayer. I'm going to give a disclaimer, and then we'll go into our presentation. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God, you are awesome. And we can't do anything but give you glory, praise, and honor simply because you deserve it for all the wonderful things that you have done in our lives and all the wonderful, as the old folk would say, manifold ways that you have blessed us. Now, God, we thank you for the opportunity to share in information and discussion. And Holy Spirit, as always, we invite you to guide this conversation so that those who have ears will hear and understand, those who have eyes will see and perceive, and everyone will receive that piece of information that will move them forward on their journey in life. God, I pray right now that you would speak through me as I give this information to your people and that it would be meek, that it would be substantive, that it would be useful to them for where they are right now. God, we thank you and bless you for this privilege and this honor. We pray for Tierra, we pray for Tanisha, and for every family and woman that's represented on this line. And man, dear God, if those here, and then for those who will hear the replay, God, allow this to be a blessing to those who need it in the way that they need it. In Jesus' name we ask this, amen. All righty, everybody, I want to first start with a disclaimer. I am not a licensed counselor, I'm not a licensed therapist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, and nor am I a medical doctor. Dr. K is a nickname that was given to me by the lovely women in the two or three groups that I'm associated with on Facebook, the women of the Corner Sisters, the women of When Women Heal, this wonderful platform, and the women in Always Journal 365. They lovingly call me that, and I am graciously and gratefully accepting it. Uh, the information that is presented tonight is not designed to diagnose or treat any physical or emotional malady or illness. This is given for informational purposes only. I pray that in it, you're able to find yourself and get some help in whatever position that you're in. But I always, always, I always recommend that when you've got some deep stuff going on, get with a counselor, they can keep you from going crazy and going in and going insane. Tonight, we're going to do a deep dive into sadness. As, as we've talked about before, we've been discussing emotions. I'm going to do a little review from the last couple of times that we presented because it's been a month. So I want to make sure that you remember the information. And our, our representative this time around is Snoopy. There is nothing sadder than Snoopy. I love Snoopy. He's usually happy, but tonight we're going to explore Snoopy's sadness. 
as we look at emotions, the first thing we want to notice is a definition. There are a lot of words that we use that have general definitions, and I like to deal in specifics. So emotion defined, and this comes from Merriam-Webster, emotion is a conscious mental reaction such as anger or fear. Conscious means you are aware of it. Subjectively experienced, that's mean it's, it's internal, a strong feeling usually directed toward a specific object or event, typically accompanied by physiological and behavioral changes in the body. So get this, you experience an emotion in response to a stimulus or a stimuli. It's directed toward a specific object, a person, a thing, a noun, any person, place, or thing, or an event uh, happening in your life. Emotions are accompanied by physiological and behavioral changes in the body. There are three components to an emotion. Emotions have a subjective component. That is exactly what you feel on the inside. That is the emotion itself and it is subjective, so only you can feel it. It's what you experience internal. And then there is physiological. Once you get that internal thing going on inside you, your body is going to respond. Whatever you see on your external is generally a result of what's happening on your internal. So if you are experiencing the emotion of sadness, you may be weepy, you may cry, you may hold your head down, you may walk with, as the Bible describes it, your hands hanging low with no pep in your step. Those are physiological. They are changes in your body as a result of what you are feeling, your emotion on the inside. And then there is an expressive component. This is what you push out to others. It's how you express that emotion, how others experience your internal activity. So in the physiological, you may cry. The expressive is also you will cry and someone will see your tears. Uh, in anger, you may clench your fist. You may, your, your jaws may swollen. We used to ask children when they got angry, why are you swollen? Your jaws will puff out, expanding the size of your face. You may grit your teeth, your nose, your nostrils may flare. Those expressions that allows people to understand where you're coming from. They can sense the emotion that you are experiencing based on the body, the body movements that you exhibit. Now, emotions serve a purpose. We've talked about this before. There are no, emotions are neither good or bad. Emotions are neutral. It's how you respond in that emotion, how you express that emotion that becomes problematic. It can either help you or hurt you. So emotions serve a very significant purpose in our lives. Emotions help us to survive and to thrive. One, emotions motivate us to take action. When we feel specific emotions, we will be motivated to maximize our chances of survival and success or improve our circumstances or our situations. For example, if you are a child and you have a major exam, or if you're a college student, a lot of us are returning to college at our older ages. We're taking classes online. If you know you've got a major test coming up, your semifinals or your final exam, and anxiety about passing that test or failing that test will motivate you to study for that test. That's how emotion serves you. When you're angry, you're more likely to confront the source of your irritation. Sometimes, sometimes Things will bother you just a little bit and you won't do anything about it. But when you hit the emotion of anger, you know that it's time to move. It's time to get involved. It's time to confront the source of your irritation. We experience fear. When we experience fear, we are likely to run from the threat. That's what fear tells us to do. Fear tells us that we are in danger. So emotions will cause us to avoid danger. We see fear, we run. But when we feel love, we may seek out a mate and reproduce. That's what the emotion of love causes us to do. And, and because it causes us to do that, to repro reproduce, we now make little humans so that our, our progeny, our race continues on the face of the planet. And then when we feel safe, when we feel the emotion of safety or security, We'll find commonality with other people and thereby we will experience community. So emotions, their purpose, how they serve us in our lives is they help us to survive and not only survive, 
but to thrive, to have a good life by motivating us to take action, by prompting us to avoid danger, by helping us in making decisions. Emotional intelligence is the ability to understand and to manage emotions. And this has been shown to play an important role in decision making. Now, Erica Bishop teaches a wonderful course on emotional intelligence on this platform. And that's the benefit of it. This emotion study coincides with that emotional intelligence so that you understand the emotions you are experiencing and then you can properly manage them. Emotions also help us to communicate. When we interact with other people, it's important to give them clues to help them understand how we're feeling. These clues might involve emotional expressions through our body language, such as facial expressions and changes in our voice or our vocal pattern. Somebody who is experiencing sadness, when they begin to talk, you might hear their voice break, break up a little bit. You might hear a catch as they try to catch their breath and keep tears from coming out that allows us to communicate with them in that moment of sadness and to understand that that's what they're experiencing, even though we don't know what they're sad about. And now we have an opportunity to give them sympathy or to give them empathy, to comfort and to console them. Emotions also help us relate. Communicate comes from us, from others to us, us letting them know how we feel, but relating is the other side of that coin. Emotions allow us to respond appropriately and build deeper, more meaningful relationships with our friends, our family, and our loved ones. They allow us to communicate effectively in a variety of social situations, from dealing with an irate customer to managing a hot-headed employee or to settling down intense fellowship moments with a spouse or family member. So emotions play a very, very significant role in our lives. In fact, I personally don't think that we could actually live without them. So know this, your emotions are a gift from God. They are a gift from God. He has given us our emotions and emotions actually come out of God. There are several Bible passages that talk about God being saddened, God being angry, God being joyful. I even believe that God gets excited. I believe that the emotions that we experience are the ones that God experiences we got them from him. And he tells us that the emotions themselves are not sins. It's how we behave as we express those emotions. We can become, we can sin in our anger. We can lash out and hurt somebody else in our own pain. So emotions play a wonderful, wonderful part in our lives. Now, this is the wonderful word will. I love the word will because I am a fan of not saying that made me feel some kind of way. Some kind of way doesn't explain what you are internally experiencing so that the person interacting with you can understand, sympathize, and empathize. That's why I love this will. Because rather than just saying I'm sad, look at all these other words. I can say I'm hurt. And as I describe being hurt, I can say I was embarrassed or disappointed. Instead of saying I'm sad, I can say I'm depressed. Now, this word depressed is different from the psychological phenomenon of depression. Next week, we'll talk about depression and distinguishing it from sadness on a greater level. But this, you can be sad to a point of being depressed, which simply means, which could mean you're feeling inferior in that moment. You're feeling empty in that moment. Guilt has a part in sadness, or sadness can be expressed in guilt. Guilty, remorseful, ashamed. Look at this. Uh, despair, powerless. I'm trying to avoid my camera. Powerless and grief-stricken, under despair. Vulnerable, that's a great word. Vulnerable, you're feeling fragile or victimized. And we're going to go through each of these words and give a description so that you can better identify when you're feeling a kind of way. And you can say in general that that kind of way is sad. This gives you a more pinpoint accurate way of describing your sadness. Why is this important? I left out lonely. Lonely, you can feel isolated and abandoned. Why is it so important that you bring out the shades, the nuances of your emotion? 
When you bring out the shade and the nuances of your emotion, you also indicate how to deal with it, how to remedy that, that negative emotion. And we said they're not negative, but that low emotion. You understand how to, how to get through it. You understand how to respond to it. Or better yet, the person who is interacting with you can help you now that they know the specific shade that you're dealing with. See how this, this word is blue? And then there's light blue, and they've gone back to this other blue. They could have used a totally different blue so that you can get the understanding that all of these emotion words are shades of the word sad. Sad is the umbrella word. But I can tell somebody I'm sad because my dog died. That's grief. Or I'm sad because I'm feeling lonely. That's isolation. There are two different solutions for that situation. I wouldn't treat sadness because I'm grieving over the death of a family pet the same way that I would treat sadness due to being alone or feeling abandoned. So that's why those shades are so significant and so important. They give you a better way. They give you a better way of allowing someone to connect with you and to communicate on the level that you're at. When you just say, I'm sad, you leave somebody guessing. <laughs> at what it is they are to do to move you beyond sad and into happy. So by giving all of these other words, these shades, you can get more specific on how to resolve your sadness, how to move beyond that moment, if you will. So let's look at these words specifically. Sadness defined means affected with or expressive of grief or unhappiness, downcast causing or associated with grief or unhappiness, depressing, sad news. So you can be downcast in your emotions. You're not up, you're not upbeat, you're not happy. Um, depressing, sad news, something that, that pushes you down. That's sadness defined and everybody deals with sadness. It happens in life, it comes with living. There is really no way to avoid it. Once you are alive, you're going to experience the entire gambit of emotions. And remember, these emotions come from God. Think about it. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, the Bible teaches us, and I'm, I'm a minister at my heart, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is God's only begotten son. And God, the Father, saw his son, Jesus, hanging on a cross. God wasn't in heaven going, hey, he's on the cross. No, God was saddened. God was saddened. In fact, in the middle of the day, there was an eclipse. The sun refused to shine when the creator hung on the cross. So God gives us sadness out of his own emotions, acknowledging that in life, there are going to be some things that do not make us happy. In life, as we deal with the loss of someone that we love or a pet that we love, or even a car that we love, grief comes from loss. And it's not just losing people, it's losing situations, it's losing circumstances, it's losing opportunities, it's losing things that you valued. So sadness defined is the expressive grief or unhappiness or that thing that causes grief or unhappiness. In other words, and here we go back to that, that word will, lonely is divided into isolated and abandoned. Now lonely is the feeling that one has no friends or company without companions, that you are solitary. There is a difference between loneliness and being alone. You can be alone and not feel lonely, and you can be in a multitude of people and be lonely. It is the feeling that there's nobody with you, that you have no one on your side. Isolated means having minimal contact or little in common with others, remote, far away from others. Look at this, isolated. It means that you feel like you don't have anything in common. One of the, one of the key parts of isolation is that you feel like you're the only one going through at the moment that you're going through. You feel like nobody else has ever experienced what you're experiencing. Nobody else has ever felt what you're feeling. And that is a trick of the enemy. When you feel isolated, remember that you are not the first one to have that experience. As I went through my divorce, 
And I talk about that a lot. In fact, at the end of this, I'll make an announcement about my book. But when I went through my divorce, um, the Lord blessed me with a lot of songs. And there was a song by Helen Baylor. And she talks about the fact that she says in the song, go on and cry, <laughs> go on and cry. And she says, you're not the first person to feel this way. You're not the first one to ever experience or go down this road. And the song was encouraging people who decide that they can't show tears because they feel tears are weakness to go ahead and understand that it's okay to cry. It's okay when you are experiencing sadness to express that sadness in tears. Well, when you're feeling isolated, you've got to remind yourself that you are not alone. Somebody has been down that road before. And we'll talk at the end of this about how to deal with those situations. This, the other part of loneliness is a band. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can I jump in real quick? You sure can. Dr. K, can you, um, I know you got to pause sometime, like, well, it depends on the topic at hand, right? Dr. K, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. K, do you mind posting, I don't, I'm assuming you don't know the name of the song, but could you post that into the group, um, into our yes. comments afterwards, or if someone knows mm -hmm. what song she's referring to, um, but you know, with, with Helen Baylor, um, if I'm can correct me if I'm wrong, but was she strung out on drugs with her husband, and um, mm -hmm. and then they were both delivered from that, and so maybe was yes, that song made during that low point in time? Do you think? I don't know when the song was made, um, but yes, that is true. In her testimony, she talks about how she was singing from childhood, hooked up with the guy who was from the group Heat Wave. He was the sound man for Heat Wave, and he was also a drug dealer, and he had her dealing drugs. And they both got saved, got married, have a, had a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal life, um, and ministered to many. But yes, I can't find that song. It it helped me out. That's what caused them um, when I was going through and I was being stoic and strong. That's what, when I knew I needed to cry, I put that song on. Wow. Because it would let me cry. It gave me permission to be weak in that moment and to cry. Now, you know, a song that does it for me and it's more relationship based is, um, is it, um, it's on the Waiting to Exhale soundtrack. I think it's Hurts Like Hell by Aretha Franklin. Have you heard mm. that one? No, I haven't heard that one. I know one by um, Natalie Cole that's called I'm Catching Hell. Mm. Well, um, go check it out. I'll try to put it in the chat, but it's more relationship based about, you know, about love. Love was always supposed to be something wonderful to me, something that mm -hmm. you watch and grow and feel beside yourself why does it hurt to love so bad um wow when you've given all you had um but dr k is powerful dr k i just wanted to chime in and say that some of my most it, being isolated can be tricky and i didn't know that was one of mm -hmm. the words to describe sadness it's interesting because i think you can have voluntary isolation and involuntary isolation and i think that right. we just have to be very uh, mindful uh, to make sure we don't slip too far into a heaviness with it but right. that it can be very productive as well it's like taking a seed and planting it in the ground so, mm -hmm. you know, as long as people understand that the isolation can have its benefits and be productive, as well as being mindful of being honest about how they're feeling throughout the process mm -hmm. and having maybe yeah. an accountability person to check on them from time to time. Well, that isolation that, that you're describing is great for getting, for, for taking the, um, like your book, uh, what is it, the peace and a pause. That, that pausing isolation is very beneficial. It gives us a chance to sit back, to regroup. This isolation that's tied in sadness, um, that aloneness, that feeling like that, that can lead you into depression. That can deepen the sadness. So having that accountability partner telling somebody, I'm feeling, you know, you may say I'm going to isolate myself because I need to think. 
I just need to be alone to get my mind together. And that, that can be very beneficial. I love the idea of having an accountability partner saying to somebody, if I don't call you in 24 hours, reach out to me. Make sure I'm not in that tank too long. Um, so that, that isolation. So thank you. That is a great idea. That is a great, that's a great um, distinguishing point. But if you're dealing with sadness, you want to be careful of being isolated, especially as you become older. Isolation is one of the greatest plagues among seniors. Uh, and I dealt with that when I was in um, and working in the Medicare Advantage realm and meeting seniors. And a lot of seniors scheduled appointments with a lady they did not know just because they were lonely. They felt isolated and they wanted to be connected to somebody. And they would take these appointments with insurance agents. And unfortunately, some of them got taken. But isolation it can, be a, can be a dangerous thing. A part of being lonely is also being abandoned. And isolated, I believe, is internal. Abandoned is still an internal feeling, but it has this kind of external motivation. It, it's the feeling of having been deserted or cast off, thrown away, intentionally left alone and someone can feel abandoned even though nobody has technically abandoned them in their isolation. They may be saying to themselves, nobody wants to be near me, nobody likes me, nobody is giving me a phone call. Uh, these are, yeah, isolated and abandoned are part of sadness. I'm trying not to keep this, I'm trying to keep this on point, not to take it too spiritual, but I have to. These are tricks of the enemy. One of the things that Satan loves to do, especially if we, when we fall short, when things go wrong, is he loves to get us up by ourselves so that he can beat up on us with negative thoughts and not speak the truth to us. So in those moments that you're sad, in those moments when you're feeling isolated and not that isolation where I'm gathering my thoughts, I'm regrouping, I'm preparing to come back out, and you're feeling abandoned, that's the time you need to reach out you make that phone call and we'll talk about that later. Reach out to somebody and say to them, I am feeling this way. When I went through my divorce, I had a day. I had a day where I knew that if I stayed by myself, it would not be good. I went to one of my close friends and I looked at her and I said, I need to be your kid for a day. And she said, what? I said, I need to be your kid for a day. I just can't be by myself. And that day, I hung out with her like I was one of her children. Literally, I gave up all decision making. If she said, this is what we're eating, I ate it. If she said, you know, go and pick that up for me, I went and picked it up because that day was a day that I was being pressed hard. And I had to get into a place where I could still be sad in her presence. I was allowed to deal with the emotion, but I wasn't in a position where I was without a person to help me. The next word in the list is vulnerable. Vulnerable, susceptible to physical or emotional attack or harm, in need of special care, support or protection due to age, disability, risk of abuse or neglect. You can feel when someone has hurt you, you can feel exposed, which is another great word, exposed, vulnerable. Means that you're now open to being hurt. That Under vulnerable, yes ma'am. I'm sorry, can I jump in? Mm-hmm. Um, can Mary, we go back? That's interesting. I know. Can we go back? Did you just talk about the emotion of, you said uh, isolation first, then abandon? Mm-hmm. So we can cause these emotions onto others, right? We can call, you mean project them? Yes. Yeah, like... Um, a person feels abandoned when someone leaves, correct? Mm -hmm. So if one, part, one party is um, trying to enforce a healthy boundary and they need to remove themselves from a connection for a while and mm -hmm. they don't want to trigger abandonment, do you feel that if they express the need to detach and it's done in a healthy way and this person knows this is going to happen, um, when, that, when the person truly does leave, 
the person that was left will still experience abandonment or will they still experience the abandonment emotion or does it change it because they were at least communicated to ahead of time? It should change it because they were communicated to. Um, and again, we can't, we can't determine what somebody else is going to do. There are people who will still feel abandoned, even though you say to them, I'm going away for a moment. Think about a, um, a child, a baby, an infant, actually more like a toddler, one that is now aware that, he's, that he or she has a mother and the mother has to walk away from them. The mother may put them in their crib, kiss them and say, I'll be right back that baby may still scream and holler like a banshee. The baby could be two years old and able to understand the words, I'll be right back and still scream and holler like a banshee. The fact that we let somebody know what we're doing, it should help, but it may not help because it depends on the, on the emotional status of the person that we're telling. So that individual may still feel abandoned even though you say, I need to just walk away for a minute. I need to gather my own thoughts. I need to get my own self together. So they could still, that could still trigger abandonment in them. Especially a lot, so much of emotions is tied to our childhood. So if that person has abandonment issues from childhood, there is pretty much nothing you can do. They're going to feel abandoned because that's a familiar emotion to them. So is that where the Holy Spirit, you know, could use a friendship? Let's say that you have someone comes into your life that you know without a doubt has been your number one support rock friend, okay? Just think of whoever that person is. You never question their love for you. But then if that person comes to you and like, you know what, Cassandra, at this point, I'm going to need to go in my own direction because this is not good for me right now. I need to do, you know, what's kind of best for me right now. And they had to talk with you out of love for you. And, and you know this. But when they go away, if you feel the abandonment trigger, because that's just the root of your makeup right now, if it's not healed. Uh, what I understand you to say is that these things, if they're unaddressed and unhealed, it could just still flare right up. But don't mm -hmm. you think that's how God uses certain people? Because now, if this was someone that gave you so much love, it's almost like, don't you think that could help you identify this is a, you know, you see what I mean? Yeah. That's why yeah. God and can sometimes to... send certain people to show you mm -hmm you're the common denominator get to mm -hmm. the root of this thing because if they can't even keep going with you and they need to now space it out a little bit it gives you that safe reflection of like it's something else what, what do you think about that dr k i think that in that moment when those abandonment feelings arise and that that person needing to walk away doesn't have to deal with something that i did they may be dealing with their, they very well are dealing with their own issues. But the abandonment triggering in me from my childhood, me feeling that way, that's the, that's the signal that I have something I need to deal with. That's the signal that, okay, why am I, feel they, they said it, had, it has nothing to do with me. They said they've got to deal with their own stuff. They've got issues that they're wrestling with and everybody has. But why am I feeling this way? Why am I feeling like they deserted me and left me high and dry when they came to me and said, what's going on? So now I get to explore my own emotions. I get to explore my own history and I get to sit quietly or I should. I should sit quietly and ask myself that question and wait on the answer because it will come. And then I get to deal with that moment or I should deal with that moment of abandonment and then I can pray and say, Lord, that, that happened as a child. I now release that person in that moment. And I now release myself in that moment. Because that abandonment can, can trigger all kinds of additional emotions with it. Um, fear being chief among them. Will I ever have another friend like that? 
will I ever, or there was something wrong with me, even though they said it wasn't, there's something wrong with me. Now I've got issues of self-worth and, and uh, worthiness and shame or guilt. So when that kind of thing happens, that's God saying, now you've got an opportunity to deal with this thing. If the person- And to put this baby to rest. If the person who went away was doing it to enforce healthy boundaries because they did notice some unhealthy behaviors in that person and they and they shared some of the observations, but they loved the person and they want they were upfront with the person. Do you feel that it's important if we have a friend that's working through that? If we said we need to go away, would it be confusing to then send something to check on them? Is that considered being supportive at a distance or is it mm. best to just go away because you handle it right and trust that God is going to move yeah I think it would be I, and I'm not I'm, I'm not the counselor on this one but I think just from where I am I like both sides I actually like the person checking in just hey I was thinking about you are you okay um, but I also like the, you know what, let me just leave them alone and let God move. Or let God tell me when I need to reconnect. Right. Because the variables are according to each person. They are innumerable because they are according to each person's own reaction. I would follow God's lead. God may put them in my spirit. And I have a personal rule that I try to operate by. I don't always operate by it, but I try. When I think about somebody three times, I try to give them a phone call. Because them coming into my mind three times generally means something's going on. And I can't mention the number of times when I call somebody and said, hey, I'm just checking on you. You were in my thoughts. What's going on? And I heard, oh, wow, it's great that you called. I need. And it was literally God prompting me to call because there was a need there. Or this just happened. Or I was just thinking about you myself and was going to reach out. So... I try to let the Holy Spirit lead me on when to call and who to call. So, but with the feelings of, with, with any emotion of sadness, the responses, or like all the emotions, they are as numerable and varied as the people who are having them. Mm. So with abandon, let God lead you. If you walk away from a friendship because you see some, now I love the example that you gave because the person didn't just pull away. They said, these are the things that I'm seeing. In, in those cases, these are the issues. So now that individual has some things to work on. If they're seeing this in me and they say, okay, I'm having to walk away because I see X, Y, and Z. And these are the signs. Remember we talked about before not asking why questions, but asking what questions? What are the reasons you're walking away? What are the signs that you're seeing? And when they come with that quality response, now I as the individual, I can, re I can respond in feeling abandoned or I can begin to do the deep work and have the difficult conversations with myself and with others. I can ask other people, do you see those same things in me? And Truthful friends will be truthful. Thanks, Are we good? Okay. Mm -hmm, that's great. Okay. I know that was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Vulnerable, susceptible to physical or emotional attack or harm. In need of special care or support or protection. And I love the list that they gave in this example due to age, disability, risk of abuse or neglect. These are really things, age and disability are things that you cannot control. All of us get older. Someone who develops a disability or who is born with a, with a different ability, as some people call it, they are, they are automatically vulnerable because of things that are outside of their control. And then there are people who are at risk of abuse or neglect. Infants, babies are in that position. People who can't do anything to protect themselves are vulnerable. Under vulnerable, we see the word victimized, singled out for cruel or unjust treatment. If you've ever wondered what victimized means, it means you're feeling that you have been singled out. Somebody picked you out of the crowd and decided to mess with you and under unjust treatment with no 
for no real reason other than they just chose you or they're victimizing you for things you can't change. Color of my skin, I can't change. <laughs> Personally, I believe my gender, I can't change. Um, change my hair color, change my hairstyle. Somebody can victimize me because they don't like the fact that I'm now blonde and no longer gray haired up to them. But victimized is the feeling of being singled out and put in and picked on. Fragile means easily broken or damaged, insubstantial, delicate, not strong or sturdy. So when you're feeling bad, when you're feeling vulnerable, you can feel fragile. You can feel like you will be, you will break easily. Those are those, those days where you just say to yourself, if somebody says the wrong thing, and I know going through my divorce, I was very, very fragile. I didn't feel so much victimization, but I did feel fragile. I hit a point where every time somebody, I couldn't talk for more than five minutes without breaking into tears. Fragile. In that moment, I was easy. If you said, looked at me the wrong way, I cried. Easily broken, easily damaged, insubstantial. Didn't feel like I had any weight to me any purpose to my life. Vulnerable people, you can feel either victimized or fragile, two words you can work with. Despair. Despair is to lose or to be without hope. The complete loss or absence of hope. This is a dangerous place to get. This despair is a dangerous place. You don't want to sit in it. You can get to any, you can get to any level of sadness for a short term most of the people that I read recommended no more than two weeks. Sadness beyond two weeks at any one of these levels needs to be dealt with with professional help. You need to reach out and get some counseling, get some help. Under despair, you lose hope. In despair, you can have grief. Grief is deep sorrow, especially that that is caused by the loss, by a loss or someone's death. Grief happens when you lose anything, not just people. Families grieve when pets pass away. People who've had a car for a long time grieve when that car finally dies and they have to get rid of it, believe it or not. When you lose precious objects like wedding rings or earrings that were handed down from great, great grandmother to grandmother down through the family, money, when you lose money needlessly or what you feel is stupidly, you will experience grief. Grief simply comes when you have a loss. Be careful with that grief. It's, it's, it's a running buddy of despair. In losing a lot of money, you may feel that there is no hope, that you can never recover. That's despair, that's grief. A tie, tied to that or akin to that is feeling powerless without the ability or the influence to make or cause change. Powerless. When I taught a youth group and we talked about power, I explained to them that power is that thing that makes a difference. Power is what makes a difference. And I told them, if you have, if you have a toaster and you put your toast in the toaster, but the toaster is unplugged, you can wait in front of that toaster all day long. Nothing is going to happen to that bread. That bread is going to remain soft and squishy and white. But when you plug that toaster into the power source, you now make a change in that toaster such that it changes your bread. Under, de under despair, you can feel like you don't have the ability, you don't have the wherewithal, you don't have the influence to change the situation that you're in. Again. That's okay for a moment, but when you sit there, it becomes problematic because then you just kind of let stuff happen to you. You just let things go. You don't want to sit in any one of these places any longer than necessary. And again, most counselors will say about two weeks. Anything that extends beyond two weeks, we need to start considering professional help. In other words, sadness, in other words, there's the word guilty. Guilty, I did not know, came up under, under sad. I thought that was an interesting combination. Guilty is the feeling or the sense or the awareness of or suffering from feelings of deserving punishment. When you feel guilty, you feel as though you deserve to be punished. 
you deserve whatever it the, the a piano could fall on you and you would feel that you deserve that piano falling on you based on what you did tied to guilt is shame and remorse when you feel ashamed it's feeling inferior or unworthy or disgraced remember that conversation tiara and i had just a minute ago about abandonment in that abandonment, you could feel guilty, you could feel ashamed, you could feel remorseful. We'll deal with that word in a minute. But you can feel like you did something and you now deserve that person walking away. That's that guilt. That's that shame. I'm inferior. I'm unworthy of their friendship. Again, you don't want to sit in any of these too long, but I want to give you the words to work with so that as you begin to describe your sadness, you have words that people can identify with and respond to. As I said, we'd handle grief differently than we handle shame. When I'm feeling shame, I've got to talk to myself. I am worthy. <laughs> I, I, I experience God's grace. I'm not inferior. Remorseful is a gnawing distress arising from a sense of guilt for past wrongs, self-reproach a gnawing distress. I love the word gnawing. Gnawing is that thing in the pit of your stomach that causes you from being able, that keeps you from being able to eat. Gnawing, that distress, that dis-ease from a sense of guilt, it's tied to shame for past wrongs. You may have done something back when you were five or six years old or eight or nine years old and it pops up into your memory. And in that moment, you feel remorseful, especially if it's something you can't go back and correct. Dr. You feel Kay. that knowing distress. Yes, ma'am. Um, can I jump in real quick and ask you something? Uh, we had talked you about sure this can. in one of your past trainings. Um, if someone shares something with you, uh, you know how you were um, suggesting in a past um training that it's best not to hold those the things in that cause shame so if you can find at least one person on the earth that you share this with you at least let it out of the body so it's now been released in some form mm -hmm. when you release it to someone that you trust who does know you who is a part of your life can you can that shame still come back where you regret having shared it where now you're like feeling even more shame or like, or does it automatically when you share it, give power to the healing because it's been released or do you then have remorse or regret about, man, I can't believe I shared that with that person. I don't think they're going to look at me the same. Wow. And both, it, it's, it's one of those, both and, yes and, both. Once you release it, I've always said the way to take, a, take the, the power out of a secret is to tell it. Once you tell the secret, the secret no longer has power on you, power over you. You're no longer working to, to keep it a secret. You're no longer fighting to remember who you can't tell it to or remember to, to keep it from coming out in conversation. Once it's out there, it's out there. And yes, that should help you relieve the shame. Here is the ticket though, depending on that person's reaction. If that person reacts like, oh my God, how could you do that? Well, they have just cemented the shame by their own reaction. If that person says, oh wow, I'm sorry you had that experience and I appreciate you for trusting me with that, that you would give me that to relieve yourself, and I'm not gonna carry it with you. We're, we can pray together, I'm a Christian, we can pray together and take this thing to God. But a lot of that response, taking back that shame, can be dependent upon the other person's reaction. That's why it's so good to get a counselor, to get somebody outside of the family, outside of your circle of friends. And the counselor has a legal obligation to keeping your secret secret. They're not allowed to discuss what you tell them with anybody else. So with a professional counselor, you know it's not going to come out at dinner when everybody is laughing and joking. <laughs> you know okay. it's not going to show up. That person is not going to get on the phone and tell somebody else, girl, 
Do you know what she said to me? You won't believe that. So when you do decide to let a secret out, know that the person that you're letting it out to and understand that once you tell one person, it's no longer a secret. You have to brace yourself for if it depend the person that you tell. If you know that they are a safe lockbox and they're not going to open up for other people and folk don't have keys to them, then you're safe. I recommend if you've really got some deep seated stuff that you need to deal with, get a counselor. Get a counselor because they are obligated by law to keep your secrets. And because they have no emotional attachment to you, there's no judgment typically because they don't have any investment in you other than that counseling relationship, they're not going to have that reaction that blows you up. They're going to uh, receive okay. your information as just that, information. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think Tanisha needed you. Um, Valerie wanted you to repeat the quote that you gave when you started this portion of conversation. Oh, the way to take the power out of a secret is to tell it. Secrets have power. They have power. And the way to destroy the power of a secret is to simply tell it. My favorite, my favorite story about that is David Letterman. When it was discovered, someone sent David, Letter, David Letterman a letter with some embarrassing pictures saying that I know you've had a relationship, I know you're married, and you've had an adulterous relationship with somebody on your crew. I'm going to go to the press unless you give me X amount of money. <laughs> I'm going to put this out. I'm going to make your secret known. David Letterman went on his TV show within two or three nights of that happening. And he said, I have a confession. And he told everything that the extorter was going to tell. He put it out there. David Letterman didn't lose his show. He didn't lose his income. He worked on his marriage. I don't know if the woman divorced him or not, but I know he, he came, became true to her first. And then he went true to his fans and his life went on. He took the power and the extorter actually ended up, he took charges, put charges on the blackmailer and the blackmailer ended up in court. So if you're dealing with a secret, find a safe place to express it, find a safe person. And if it is so significant that you don't feel there's anybody in your life that you can tell, get a counselor, get a counselor. Cause those secrets, they can become, depending on the kind of secret that it is, it will become an illness. It will fester in your body and you will get sick. It becomes a root, it, it becomes a bitter root with an ugly blossom. So deal with that. Uh, remorseful, gnawing distress, we talked about that. Depressed. This depressed is different from going into a depression. Now, if you are sad or feeling any of these for more than two weeks, you may be sliding into a depression, in which case you need professional help. I knew that I needed, and I was seeing a counselor and going into depression. What, when I explained to her that I couldn't stop crying, that every time I, if you said good morning to me, I was in tears. My children kissed me on their way to go to school. As soon as the door closed, I broke down. When I said that to her, she said, okay, you're becoming clinically depressed. And she put me with a, psychiat with a psychiatric nurse who was able to prescribe medication that I took for two or three months to get me through that time period. So, but the mild depressed, just down is low in spirits simply means down you're not having one of those up days and everybody has a day that's just not an up day some days you you expected sunshine and you go outside and it's rain and you see the clouds in the skies and you had made plans to go on a picnic or go to the zoo one of my favorite places you had made plans to work in your garden and now the rain stops that you may be low down or down low for that day. And then the next day when the sun comes out, it's all good. Under depression, you can feel empty or under depressed, you can feel empty, containing nothing, hollow, not full, destitute of force, having no purpose. Is that not a, a serious, I, I, when you go through an emotional upheaval, 
especially when you're dealing with a betrayal and it's been uncovered, you can feel empty. You can feel like I have no reason to live. That lasting too long slides into a depression for which we need to get help. You can also feel inferior. Inferior means of little or less importance, value or merit, poor quality. You can feel like as a human, as a person, as an individual, you have no self-value. You have no self-worth. You go back to that abandoned feeling. This, this inferiority can come in with that. I know that, that you know they walked away because I'm just not good friend material. I'm not worthy of being their friend. That comes under lasting too long can go into depression, but you're feeling in a depressed moment at that moment. And then hurt. Hurt is inflicted with physical pain or emotional anguish. I know we call it emotional pain, but I love saying it's emotional anguish. It's that angst. It's, it's that gnawing distress. Under hurt, you can be disappointed, defeated in expectation or hope, not adequately equipped. Defeated in expectation or hope is my favorite of these two definitions. Defeated in expectation. Remember we talked about that cloudy day? You're now disappointed. You can be depressed. It can go into disappointment. You can be disappointed. It can go into depressed. But what you're feeling is, I was expecting something good and I didn't get it. Um, mm. There is a, a disappointment that comes with unmet expectations. <laughs> when you expect something and don't get it. If you're dealing with that, please make sure you tell the person that you were expecting to get it from that you were expecting it. Because sometimes we have unexpressed expectations and then we end up disappointed when those expectations haven't been met, but we didn't tell anybody we were expecting them to meet them. And we put them at an unfair disadvantage. Embarrassed is the last word we're going to deal with. Embarrassed is feeling or showing a state of self-conscious confusion and distress. So when you say that you were embarrassed, you're in a state of self-conscious, you're self-aware and not necessarily in a good way. When you are embarrassed, this is not a good thing. This is a, for a moment, it's okay. You may blush. <laughs> you may misspeak, say the wrong word, come in at the wrong point of a conversation. And for that moment, you are self-conscious of your confusion. In that moment, you may become distre distressed about it. Um, one of the most well-known embarrassing moments in history was Janet Jackson during the, the Super Bowl. Can't remember what year it was, but she had a wardrobe malfunction. That's embarrassing. <laughs> you walk into the room and oh, us old-fashioned folk wear slips and somebody might say, I see your slip hanging or your bra strap is hanging down. Those are things that for, for a moment, you experience confusion. Those are all of the different shades of hurt. So got a lot of words you can work with. I don't ever want to end these, these sessions on low notes. I don't want to ever end without giving you some things you can do. And again, I've got my Snoopy up. So Let's talk about how do we get help for sadness. What are the things that we can do to alleviate sadness? We can connect with other people, make a phone call, take a yoga class, join a jogging club, a knitting circle, or another group that interests you. And if you don't know what interests you, try something you've never tried before. If you've never gone bowling, go bowling. If you've never, I would admit, I wouldn't advise bungee, bungee jumping at this stage of my life. I just heard my kids say, mom, great. But you could try something safe like zip lining. There are places where you can go to. There are, um, I would never jump out of a plane, a perfectly good plane. I won't parachute. But there are these places where you can actually um, air, you can fly in a tunnel. You can parachute without the plane. It's a tunnel with air coming up and you jump in and the air treat you like you're parachuting. But when you're feeling sad, especially that isolated and abandoned, it's important to connect with other people. Call somebody you haven't talked to in a while. You will be amazed how excited they are to hear from you. 
you will be amazed. I've called people up out of the blue and it's been, wow, it is so great hearing your voice. And that'll, that will literally lift your day. Build in time each day for an activity that you enjoy. Get into the habit, that's self-care. That is good self-care. Whatever it is that you like doing, give yourself 15, 30 minutes, an hour of that a day. If you like soaking in the tub, soak in the tub. If you like playing a computer game, play a computer game, especially now that you can compete with people from all over the world. If you like to read, set aside 30 minutes and read a good book, a book that will lift your spirits, read a book that will encourage you. You can watch funny television shows or movies. You can read a lighthearted or funny book. There it is. Watch funny television shows. Watch funny movies. When you're sad, the last thing you need to do is watch a tearjerker. When you're not feeling at your best, when you're not feeling up, the last thing that you need to do is turn to some of the Lifetime and Hallmark movies. You need movies that are going to lift your spirits. Watch comedy specials. There are some great comedians out there. You can YouTube pretty much anybody and everybody. I love good, clean comedy. There is a Facebook page called Dry Bar Comedy. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. I have Sirius in my car, on my car radio. There is Laughter USA, Laugh Town USA. It's good, clean comedy that will just have you cracking up. I have several books that I go to. I love cartoons. I used to keep a, a Peanuts book. And I used to have another book of a, a little character named Calvin. Whenever I just needed something to make me laugh, I'd open up the book to any page and just start reading. These are ways that you can come out of sadness. And remember, you don't want to stay in sadness. That's a place where you don't want to hang out. Anything longer than two weeks is problematic. Actually, I think anything longer than a couple of days is problematic. You need to start to reach out. You need to start to do things to come out of that pit. If you love animals, spend time each day with a furry friend. If you don't have your own furry friend, the local pet adoption agency, we used to call it the pound, we're not allowed to call it that anymore, but the local pet adoption agency is always looking for volunteers. Take one Saturday a month and go and volunteer. Pet some of the dogs, hold some of the cats, help them on some animal rescues. If you love animals, spend time each day with a furry friend. Do not, this is important, do not self-medicate through the use of drugs or alcohol. Alcohol is really a depressant and drugs are a momentary or a temporary escape. The worst thing about both of them is that when you go back to them, you have to up the ante. Your body becomes desensitized. It gets used to one amount. And in order to get the same feeling of elation or the same, the same feeling of escape, you've got to use more. This is how people end up with overdoses, is they take more than they needed to get quote unquote high. So when in your sadness, do not drink, do not do drugs. Um, and it actually, if you are really long-term sad, even the occasional glass of wine that might help you relax, that could become problematic because you could start to escape and go after, a, start to chase after a feeling that will take you down a deep hole. Treat yourself kindly by eating healthy and trying to get enough sleep. You would be amazed, amazed at how beneficial a good night's sleep is. One of my favorite radio pastors, a gentleman named Paul Shepard, Paul Shepard, he's a pastor out in California. Can't remember, I think the name of his church is Destiny Christian Center, but don't quote me on that. But Paul Shepard says, you're only promised the mercy enough for one day. At the end of the day, when you run out of mercy, go to sleep, because the new mercies don't download until the sun comes up. <laughs> Jeremiah teaches us that God's mercies are new every morning. So sometimes when you are sad, what you may be is exhausted. You may just need a moment of resting. I see that there are some people saying something in the chat. I have to log off. Okay. You may just need some time to rest and you will not believe how beneficial six to eight hours of sleep can be, especially when you've had a down day. 
So treat yourself kindly. Also, don't binge ice cream, the comfort foods, all of the heavy carbs. Don't binge. Eat a healthy meal. Go get some salad. Go get something green into your system. These things will help you to feel better because a lot of times what we're feeling emotionally can be triggered by nutrition. We can have nutritional deficiencies that can trigger different emotions, sadness being one of them. So treat yourself kindly, eat healthy, get some sleep, and you will be amazed at what sleep will do for you. Now, if you have trouble sleeping, and this is the last slide, we are almost done. We're gonna end this before nine o'clock if there are no questions. If you have trouble sleeping, try meditating or taking a warm bath before bed. What also helps with trouble sleeping is a nighttime routine. If you're one of those people like me who tends to fall asleep on the couch in front of the TV set, that used to be me, that's not me anymore. And now I've cut out TV, a lot of it. Uh, but if you're one of those people who doesn't have a nighttime routine, develop a nighttime routine, especially if you have trouble sleeping, because that routine will help you to fall asleep. With that routine, what you're telling your body is, I'm ready to go to bed. It's time to go to sleep. And your body will begin to shut itself. Your mind and your body will begin to shut down as you develop a nighttime routine. The routine may be taking a warm bath, eating a light snack, taking a warm bath, and then just turning out the lights and laying down. That could be a routine. As you lay down, preparing to sleep, review the day. Think about your wins. What went really, really well today? And go to sleep with those good, positive thoughts, that good, positive energy. Simplify your life as best you can. This can be so difficult. But simplify your life. Sometimes we're just too busy and we can become overwhelmed. We talked about that in anger. We've said yes to way too many things. And in saying yes to all of those things, we now feel all of those things closing in on us. So begin to say no. We talked about this in the group that no is a complete sentence. And let me help you with this. You don't have to tell somebody why you're saying no. You can just say no. You don't have to give an excuse. You don't have to give a reason. No is a complete sentence all by itself. Simplify your life. Get Remember, you've got to set time in every day to do something that you enjoy. That's self-care. Doing something that you choose to do, that you want to do, not that you feel obligated to do or that somebody asks you to do. So once you start to cut out some of that extracurricular activity, you can begin to boost your mood and choose wisely what you choose to participate in. And the things that you people ask you to do, you can simply say no and walk away. No, thank you. If they say, do you want to do, if you really don't want to do it, no, thank you. I appreciate you asking me and walk on. You don't have to tell them, well, I can't make it because I've got this, that, and the third. You can just say, no, thank you. I appreciate you asking me. And then you walk on or you change the conversation. But that helps you to simplify your life where you don't feel like you are pushed in 92 different directions. And then the last one is engage in physical activities or sports. Now, I love Snoopy and I love Snoopy when he's dancing. A lot of times when I respond to good news, I, my, my gift will be Snoopy dancing. Engage in physical activities. Dancing is a phenomenal, phenomenal physical activity. Even with the shutdown, you can get on YouTube and there are people teaching line dances. There's a meetup group out of Denton and the guy teaches line dances from his home. It's a Zoom meeting. He walks through the dance, he turns on the music and you get 30 or 45 minutes of good physical exercise. You get your blood flowing. All of that will help boost your mood. So engage in physical activities. If you like to bowl, go bowling. If you like to play tennis, find somebody to play tennis with. And if you don't have anybody to play tennis with, go to the range. They have those wonderful walls. Just practice hitting the ball against the wall and work on your control. Practice your serve. 
engage in physical activities. If you are older and you can't do the heavy lifting type stuff, join, there's one of the churches near me has a quilting circle. People who get together and quilt and fellowship and enjoy one another's company. Get physical, you can go dance, you can, you can cook. Great physical activity and your friends will love you for it, especially if you invite them for dinner. Or sports. If you're young and you're able, go play soccer, go play football, go play, uh, what's the other one we used to play? Kickball, volleyball, tennis, all kinds of sports. The idea is that when you are sad, and there are great ways to express your sadness, but you don't want to sit in sadness for too long. You want to get out of it. You want to get back to a state of happiness. I believe personally that uh, that ought to be our normal state. Our normal state ought to be happy. It ought to be excited. It ought to be joyful and joy filled. These are some ideas to help you get there. Are there any questions, Tanisha? I don't have any questions, Dr. K, but this has been so, so phenomenal. Um, our responses have just been really good. And, and these um, comments about the help for sadness, things that you can do, this part has been even um, so helpful to everyone. People are saying, oh my goodness, Miss Lisa Green, she said, oh my goodness, this is, this is so helpful. Um, Valerie said, great suggestions, Dr. K. Um, and she's gonna check out the Dry Bar Comedy. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, I just, I can attest to the fact that having a, a nighttime routine is helpful. I mean, they tell you to do that even with your babies when you're, yeah. when you first have children to get them into a routine to help them to put them on a schedule. And, you know, yeah. as adults, we begin to just kind of do everything and then want to hop in the bed and just immediately go to sleep. And it just does not work that way. It helps mm -hmm. so much to just take some decompressing time and settle your mind so that you'll be able to rest. And I also agree with the idea that, um, you know, going to sleep when you wake up, it kind of, it just refreshes you and gives you a new outlook. I never considered mm -hmm. the fact, you know, the word of God says it's new mercies every day. That's a great way to just look at it and um yeah. but i definitely can attest to the fact that you know going to sleep will just it's like some things will work themselves out mm -hmm. just get you a nap <laughs> yeah it's it's amazing the stuff that we do for our children and that we did as children we somehow think that as adults it's no longer necessary Okay. <laughs> I know everybody remembers hating naps as a child oh my god why have i got to lay down that what I wouldn't give for some days where I could just take two hours out and sleep. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, it, uh, Valerie, she, she needs more. She said it's so good. So Valerie, Dr. K is going to be back talking about uh, the second side of, of sadness on next Monday at 8.30. Um, Miss Rhonda Glaze said this was very helpful, great information. And so thank you, Dr. K, just for being so diligent as always and um, helping us, you know, to just uh, get the information that we need and helping us to understand the, uh, the deep dive into the different emotions. And so this month, the month of July, we're talking about sadness for two weeks. And then is it fear? It'll be fear the last two weeks yeah so the last two weeks ladies and uh gentlemen we'll talk about fear so please invite people into the group in the past we have um we have uh had an open group but right now we are a private group so if you want people to benefit from the information that's being shared on monday nights please invite them to the group when women heal and they will be able to, we'll join them in and they'll be able to um, participate. So go ahead, Dr. K, and share your information about your, uh, your book launch because we want to be able to support you. Thank you. Thank you. I am excited and happy, glad to announce the Tilted Fedora Trainer's first book, 
and it's called Moving Beyond Betrayal, Help Getting Past What You May Never Get Over. I'm launching the book on August Saturday, August 1st at 11 a.m. here in Duncanville, Texas, where I live. So if you are in Dallas, in the greater DFW area, I invite you to come and celebrate with me. The cost for the event is $40. That includes brunch, a Cajun buffet, Cajun brunch buffet, and an autographed copy of the book. It's $40 if you go to my website, www.thetiltedfedoratrainer.net. Let's see, I've got my hat on, thetiltedfedoratrainer.net. There is a link on that website to purchase your ticket, and I will see you on August 1st. There's also a link if you're not able to attend the book launch. The book is available for pre-order, and for those who order it on the pre-order basis, I'm not charging shipping. I'm not charging for shipping and I'm not charging the tax. I will cover both the shipping and the tax as a launch, as a pre, as a pre, um, a pre-order special. So the cost of the book is $25 and that's $25 flat. You won't have to pay additional tax. You won't have to pay additional shipping and handling. Um, if you'll order that now before the book actually becomes available, it is in the final stages of being published. It is going back to the actual printers so that the live copies will be ready prayerfully by the middle of this month, but most definitely by August 1st. So if you can make it, it will be at the Pelican House Restaurant, 107 South Cedar Ridge in Duncanville, Texas, and you will receive a delicious, a delicious buffet brunch, an autographed copy of the book, and we'll do some readings. I've got a couple of special guests that I'm asking to be there. It's gonna be a good time. It's going to be a good time. Thank you so much, Dr. K. Listen, ladies, go ahead and support Dr. K by either um, being a part of her brunch if you are in the Texas. Now, is Duncanville in the like Dallas area? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's just south of Dallas. If you're familiar with Dallas, it's Dallas, Oak Cliff, and then Duncanville. Okay. Okay. So we're so, literally the first suburb outside of Dallas. Very good. If you are in that area, please go and support her on August 1st. And if not, make sure that you get your pre-order in um, so that you can get the book. We were privileged to be a part of the initial training and it is just, I can only imagine what else Dr. K has added to the information since she first taught it a couple of years ago and it is it's it's just transformational and um and you you want to get this you want to get this book you have someone in your life it might be you or someone that you know who can benefit from understanding this idea of uh, moving beyond the trail. So everybody, thank you so much for being here tonight. We are going to, Dr. K, if you want to close us out in prayer, and we'll see you guys next week to complete the idea of uh, sadness, the deep dive into sadness and for our Monday night meetup. Mm. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had in this in this place of transformation, of learning. God, thank you that you have given us the capacity to get knowledge and wisdom and understanding how great you are, God. Father, we thank you that this is not just mere words. It's not just mere information, but you will use this to move someone out of sadness as they understand the different shades and as they begin to express properly what they're feeling so that then they have the information, they have the, they have the tools to move out of that place, oh God. I thank you for the precious privilege and honor that you give me in that these women would come to hear me teach. God, I am, I'm just humbled, I'm grateful, I'm excited, I, I'm touched. Lord, I just thank you for the privilege and the honor that they show me. And I thank you, God, for each one of them. I pray your abundant blessing on each of their lives and each of their houses. God, I pray that your peace would arrest, rule, and abide over their lives as they now have the tools to move out of sadness and to get into that place of happiness and more significantly into that place of joy that is truly found in you. God, I pray that as we go through these teachings, that we would be able to live we would be empowered to live the abundant life 
that Jesus promised when he said in John, John, I think it's 317, I came that they might have life and that life more abundantly. It's his wonderful, magnificent name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty, ladies. Thank you so very much for tuning in. I appreciate you all. And some of you, I pray to see you on the first. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Hats are hot. <laughs> <laughs>